Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, this is really exciting for me. So um, this is really Tyler's show. So I, I don't know why I am even listed here. He should be doing all this, but I can at least introduce him. Uh, so Tyler um, is an RSM here at IDA. He's been working here for, I guess, about eight years now. Um, and he is the, the developer of this the software library Skipper, which is a package developed here uh, for optimal design generation and power evaluation. And that's really what he's going to be talking about today. Uh, Tyler received his PhD in physics from Johns Hopkins University, uh, and he is also the author of several other R packages for data visualization, mapping, and cartography. And uh, I definitely recommend you check out his GitHub and Twitter feed uh, because some of those other packages are really uh, worthy of several talks just on their own. All right. Thank you, Drew. Over to you. All right. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for the introduction, George. Um, uh, yes, I'm Tyler Morganwall. Uh, I, I'm an R RSM here at uh, IDA, um, working in the evaluation, uh, operational evaluation division. And um, George and I both uh, jointly developed uh, Skipper um, as part of our work here at IDA, and we managed to get it out. And, and I know now it's being used throughout the community. So I thought this was uh, last year. I actually talked to a bunch of uh, people at various uh, OTAs who were using Skipper for their work, and I spent such a long time talking to them that. It actually kind of, it, it was sort of a mini workshop on its own. So rather than uh, siloing all that information and individual discussions, this year we decided to put on a full-on workshop. So this is that. Um, I actually have, uh, let's see, here we go. So uh, there's actually a website um, with the workshop materials. So if you go to github.com slash tylermorgamall slash skipper underscore dataworks underscore workshop, uh, you'll see uh, all of the sort of there, there's code that is included with the workshop that you can follow along as I go through the talk. Um, you can also access the code itself. So there's a nice HTML version that has the code already run that I'm going to be going through. Um, but there's also the, the actual uh, R files that you can then run yourself, and you can actually follow along and run this as I'm talking if you, you know, are interested uh, and, and want to see how this is actually um, how it actually works, and, and maybe if that you know you have questions when you're using it, uh, feel free to bring that up. We're also uh, so George will be monitoring the Zoom questions, and during the talk, um, there's a specific if if you have something that's not as pressing, like not about a specific thing in a specific slide, um, uh, you know, you can put that in the Zoom chat, and George can. Either George can handle it because he he did uh, has done a lot of work with Skipper on me as well, or uh, he can give it to me at one of those uh, Zoom slides. Um, if you have some question about something, uh, feel free to bring it up in here or on Zoom, and George will will you know make the decision whether uh, to, to interrupt my flow and uh, bring it up right right at that moment. So, so I, I always like to start talks with you know what, the bottom line up front, what you're going to take away from this. Um, so. This workshop is kind of meant for people who are doing DOE uh, ha and have used other software for DOE um, or are interested in doing DOE in a, in a more rigorous way. Um, but if you've used uh, other software to you know, generate designs and evaluate power for designs, uh, th this kind of, but you're, you haven't done it in code or you're interested in, in trying to use R for the first time, um, or you know you, you have some knowledge about R and you're just interested in moving that DOE workflow to R to match like the rest of your analysis. Um, this is this workshop is is definitely meant for you. But I, I'm not assuming any sort of really rigorous pre-existing knowledge about R. Um, the other thing that I'm really going to emphasize are the benefits of working in a reproducible workflow. Um, and, and what that can give you as an analyst and what sort of benefits that can give your organization. Um, so that is one sort of overall high-level thing. The, the next thing I'm going to talk about specifically uh, is about uh, generating optimal designs and why you might want to with Skipper um, So and how doing that entirely in code can help. Um, so that we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about um, one of the most powerful things in Skipper is its really flexible, adaptable interface for doing power analyses using a method called uh, uh, using Monte Carlo methods, and that this me uh, method for computing power is incredibly, incredibly powerful and produces very accurate results, even with highly nonlinear sort of responses. Like if you're doing a logistic regression, so you're designing an experiment to look at, you know, uh, compare something to a, a requirement for a probability of some event happening. Um, 
oftentimes we deal with these logistic regressions, but it's very hard to compute power using sort of normal methods that uh, are supported in most other uh, software suites. So uh, Skipper allows you to do that, and there's some really powerful techniques there. Um, I'm also going to talk about how your power analysis actually informs your data analysis. I, I don't think this point is brought up enough when we're talking about power. I mean, we usually talk about power in terms of a, a little bit separate from the actual analysis, but the two are intrinsically linked. And I'm going to talk how your power analysis can actually act as sort of an analysis plan for when you eventually do your actual analysis and what uh, features in Skipper allow it to really support uh, you to do that. And then finally, um, because this was actually a big topic of conversation I had last year, um, is I'm going to show you how you can compute, compute uh, power versus sample size and effect size curves. Because I think these are one of the primary sort of outputs that people really want. They want to understand their full resource to power to effect size trade space. And I'm going to show you how that's uh, just like a single function call in Skipper um, and how you can generate these and how you can interpret them and use them to, to drive your conversations about effectiveness for your uh, experimental designs. So as the overall outline for the talk, uh, we're just going to go over a quick introduction to DOE, uh, R, and Skipper. Then I'm going to dive right into the GUI. So there's a GUI included in Skipper. It's, it's pretty slick. Uh, then we're going to talk about optimal design generation. And then finally, we're going to go over evaluating statistical power. So let's get into the sort of a high, higher level introduction to all, all these topics. Um, so over the next few slides, I'm going to answer a series of slightly more specific questions. So first, I'm going to ask, you know, why, why do we want to use R? What are the benefits of R? Um, then I'm going to talk about, you know, why we use DUE. Uh, what uh, does that bring to your organization's uh, test design and analysis? Or what value does that bring to, to that process? Then specifically, I'm going to talk about why we do optimal DOE. So, you know, design of experiments is a it's a hundred year old field, technically back to Fisher, and um, and really in the last thirty years or so, we've had a, a real revolution in computational power that has enabled us to produce much more adaptable and customized designs um, using optimal DOE. And so, I'm going to talk about that. And then finally, I guess the uh, the, the, the primary point of this talk, why do we want to use Skipper for optimal DOE in R? So why do you want to use Skipper versus some other software like Jump or StatEase? Or there, there's a lot of software out there to do uh, design of experiments. So what value does Skipper bring? So first, uh, why exactly do we use R? Um, so one thing that R brings to the table is it's purpose built for statistics. So versus other programming languages. So something like Python, uh, it has the statistical functionality sort of bolted on after the fact. Well, R was designed from the ground up with data science and statistical work in mind. So th the, the entire software language was built around doing statistics. So that's really powerful. Um, and with that, uh, R has by far the most uh, capable uh, statistical ecosystem out there for doing data analysis, data visualization, uh, data manipulation, hypothesis tests, uh, the, the very statistical suites enable you to do very advanced things that other software, you know, sometimes doesn't even begin to support. And because it's been in development for, you know, since the mid 90s, and it has a very large uh, user base of, of professional statisticians, uh, a lot of this stuff has been rigorously uh, uh, reviewed. And, and so you can have very good confidence when you're using R that the uh, a lot of the behavior is giving you good results. So third, uh, because it's a scripting coding language, uh, it supports a reproducible workflow. And that's super important. Um, I think as an analyst uh, myself, working in a reproducible workflow is, is really great because I can then, if somebody has questions about what I did or what sort of numbers I came up with, I don't have to remember what sort of buttons I pressed in the GUI or you know what red triangle I clicked or if I did or did not click it. Um, what I can do is I can go back and I just rerun the script and see, yep, th these are the numbers I got. Um, so that so this idea of you know being able to audit your future, uh, your previous work is I think one selling point. But to me as an analyst, that that is only sort of a half benefit because it's like, oh, somebody can go in the future, look at what I did and then tell me I was wrong. That that doesn't seem like a benefit. Um, but what, what is a real benefit, and I think this is the real selling point, is oftentimes as an analyst, I'm given a very similar 
test design problem over and over again. So let's say I'm working on a program that has multiple increments, and each time we have a, a, a slightly, you know, a, some sort of new uh, capabilities, but what I'm doing is I'm testing the same system over and over again. And there's some tweaks to the test design because some things have changed, but by and large, having to replicate the entire effort of creating that design, getting it through, you know, everyone, as a sort of a de novo new sort of design. And then going through that whole process is a lot more work than saying, hey, I changed three lines to account for the new conditions. We all agreed that this, this design was good before. I, it's generated exactly the same way. Like I, I, know, I know people know what's going on here and, and being able to go through that entire process knowing that you know we've approved of this before and there's very few changes. And, and also I didn't make any mistakes because you know, I can review it. It's just really powerful and saves a lot of work from your end. Um, so it acts as a really nice scaffolding to, to save you work in the future when you have these scripts. And then finally, um, the sort of uh, great thing about R is it's open source. Um, what that means is, you know, from a monetary view, uh, point of view, you are not paying anything on an ongoing basis. You're not paying a per seat fee. Um, there is no, you know, costs in terms of, you know, monetary costs. It's, uh, and it's cross-platform, so you can do it on R, Linux, Windows. It's supported on multiple different systems. Um, Probably the only downside is, you know, you have to get it through IT. That's by far the biggest challenge is you have to get these systems through your IT and get them to, you know, be like, yes, this is fine. Uh, I know plenty of organizations have done it, but that is always kind of the hardest push um, and, and get them the idea of, yeah, yeah we're going to install a programming language, but, you know, there are ways to do that where it's safe and fine. So that is why I think we should use R. So we're at DataWorks 2023. Um, I, I hope people are on board with using design of experiments. Um, if not, it's generally speaking, it's it's a framework for intelligently creating experimental designs. So design of experiments just gives you a set of analytic methods and techniques for evaluating and coming up with designs. And it also provides, you know, set designs that statisticians have, you know, know are good. Um, but really the main benefit of DOE, uh, design of experiments is to avoid doing stuff like one factor at a time testing. It allows you to investigate multiple factors at once in an intelligent way to efficiently use your resources, to extract the most information from your test as you can. And working in a resource constrained environment, which we all do, um, that is super important. So it just to ensure your designs are as good as they can be, DOE provides you the, the analytic capabilities to do that. So why specifically, when we're doing DOE, you know, they're actually, you know, DOEs existed for longer than we've had optim uh, optimal designs, which were invented sort of in the 70s. DOE has existed, you know, really in its modern form since the 50s. And what, uh, what DOE brings is sort of a bunch of um, designs that are extract a lot of information. But the issue with a lot of those, like full factorial, fractional factorial, central composite design, Latin squares, these these are designs that you can kind of look up in a book and say, I have this sort of test, uh, design problem, like what is the best design? And a statistician would look it up and say, oh, it looks like you want to do, given these resources, a fractional factorial design or something. But the main issue with that is that they don't really adapt to uh, sort of non-standard design regions. You, you, you don't have a custom design for every single scenario. So uh, for example, here on the right, we have a flight envelope. Uh, a very normal thing we would encounter in testing because we can't fly at every single altitude or at arbitrary altitudes and speeds. You, you have to stick within a certain envelope of points. And the issue with classical DOE is uh, it's going to want to put points where the design says it is, but oftentimes we can't put them at any point in the design space. Uh, we have to stick them someplace in this sort of non-linear region. And so working with those kind of constraints, um, if you chose an optimal, uh, a, a traditional DOE design, you would have to sort of manipulate it to fit within this, and you wouldn't get sort of the most power out of that design. Optimal DOE allows you to account for all of these types of weird constraints and design a, a an experimental design that that's best for your particular uh, organizational purpose. So, as an example of some constraints, um, we have obviously available resources. You know, we only get an infinite, a finite amount of money from Congress uh, for doing uh, lots of our things or, you know, from your organization. Um, so having, you can't have 
uh, an infinite number of test points to you know, really investigate everything to your heart's content. Um, secondly, we have safety concerns. Uh, so in this case, uh, we want to ensure that we don't test in a way that can harm people or you know, uh, cause personal injury. And oftentimes, that means that we are constrained on sort of what test points we can use. Um, and finally, we have this idea of a, a disallowed combination uh, from, from just sort of physical reasons. So this flight envelope, we, we can't test at any point um, because sometimes it's just not possible or sometimes um, you know, just the, we know the system's not gonna be effective in some regions so that we don't wanna test points there. So these are some examples. Um, so I've talked about optimal DOE, and DOE is kind of like this great tool that allows you to do this, but what exactly is it? Um, so how do traditional DOE designs like fractional factorial and factorial designs actually differ from optimal DOE? Um, first, in a large part, they don't. Uh, so traditional DOE, uh, so that stuff like full factorials and fractional factorials are generally the optimal design for a particular set of constraints, in this case, usually unconstrained designs. And what uh, classical DOE really is, is it's the subset of optimal designs that can be found by a statistician using pen and paper and analytic methods. So it, it is the subset that where you don't need computers to find these designs. And because of that, these designs actually tend to be really, really good. So I always tell people if they can use a you know, factorial or fractional factorial design, don't skip the entire process of generating the design. Just, just use that because those have lots of really great properties and are the optimal design. If you use an optimal design in Skipper and generated something with the exact constraints given to you by like a fractional factorial design, it will likely spit out a fractional factorial design. Um, so I, I, that, that is one thing I say is, is really traditional DOE is just a subset of optimal DOE. However, um, when the types of constraints we mentioned earlier are present, um, usually there is no analytic way, there's no pen and paper way to find out which design is best. Um, we have to resort for looking for design using computational methods, so algorithms. Um, which is what uh, the methods and techniques and optimal DOE allow us to do. Um, and we have different statistical criteria. So basically different uh, statistical goals we can actually achieve. So you, you, there's not just you know, optimizing to make the goal best. Sometimes you want to optimize for a specific purpose. Um, and optimal DOE allows you to adapt to your nonlinear constraints or your, your non-ideal constraints and then uh, fit find the best design for that particular situation. Uh, for example, let's say you wanted to design a test design for, um, let's say, um, minimal prediction variance. So you want to find like a sweet spot in your, uh, in, uh, in your operational test environment or, or your um, test space. You want to find where the system performs best. In that case, you're going to want to predict across the space. And in that particular instance, you want to use an I-optimal design, which minimizes the average prediction variance across the space versus, let's say, a D-optimal design or, or an alias-optimal design, each which have their own purposes. So talking you know, about these algorithmic techniques, it, it, it does still seem a little more esoteric. So I'm going to give a, a concrete example of a simple example of what, what I mean by an optimal design. Um, so most of what optimal designs really do is they formalize uh, our own intuition about what makes a good design. Um, so by a good design, I really mean a balanced design. And what the optimal designs do is they balance the design waiting for some specific goal, like the prediction variance or characterization of performance across the envelope or minimal correlation. But really, the, the primary thing they're doing is trying to establish balance. So let's say we had a test where we were trying to determine the difference in performance between two dart players. And let's say you knew nothing about DOE, but you came in and you said, you know, that guy looks like a real good player, so I'm gonna give him two darts because I don't need to characterize his performance very well because he, he looks like a dart player. And the other person came in, you know, you look like me, uh, you just you, like, oh yeah, you don't know what you're doing. Like, obviously, you know, I am gonna give you as many shots as you can because I'm gonna see, you know, I, I bet you're gonna do really poorly and I really wanna characterize how you do because I, I think you're going to do poorly. So you do that, and let's say, you know, uh, you run this, and it, yeah, your, your intuition here came out, uh, you know, you get a lot more shots around, like you see here, this person did really well, the average is right, you know, right near the center. Well, my average is still pretty good, but you know, you see a lot more variance. The issue with this is that our intuition, what says, hey, we should give both people an equal shot, 
is actually the uh, the right thing to do from a, a design point of view. And that's because when you only give the top person or the person on the left two darts, what what happens is there's a lot of unknown, a lot of variance to that estimate. Um, and when you're trying to tell the difference between two players' performance, what really matters is not only the point estimate of how they did, but also that variance term. So what happens is uh, for DOE or for um, for the optimality criteria, you can actually compute the optimality, the de-optimality of this design. And when you look at the allocation of darts between these two players, you can actually see you get the best de-optimality at an even allocation. So what our intuition says is, hey, we should give them each a fair shot and then compare it. Um, makes sense. And, and this this might seem like a dumb example because you might be thinking, well, obviously you'd want to give them you know equal shots to compare their performance. But let's replace uh, this dart game. Let's say instead of we have player A and player B, let's say we have a system performing in two environments. And we come in and we say, well, we know the system does great in a desert environment. We really want to characterize how it does in an urban environment. So we want to allocate more runs to the urban environment. I, I've had this conversation many times. We've, we want to allocate more runs to the urban environment so we can better characterize it there. But if your issue is to determine how the difference in performance is between those two environments, you're not getting the most information because when you put those two points in the desert environment, you're, there's a very high variance. You could have what we see here, beginner's luck, um, and you could get really lucky or you could get really unlucky, and that's the whole variability part. So part of what DOE really does and, and optimal DOE is they balance designs with a particular statistical flavor. Um, Speaking of statistical flavors, these are the three major ones that I'm going to talk about. These are the three primary workhorses of optimal DOE. Um, so we have uh, D-optimal, I-optimal, and alias-optimal. So D-optimal designs uh, minimize the variance of the parameter estimates. So uh, they're basically, what they do is they uh, give you the, um, for each estimate, they, they minimize the variance in that term. And what that really does uh, is it helps you best characterize performance across the space. So these are often the, the most powerful designs overall for all of the terms um, because they really do tend to um, minimize that overall variance. Now, for individual terms, you could see some terms be better characterized by other optimality criteria. But generally speaking, this if you're trying to evaluate the full model and you treat all the terms equally, D-optimal will give you the best design for that. And in general, you can see that when you calculate power, it will give you the best power uh, across all terms. So here uh, on the bottom, I've actually uh, put a little uh, dis actual disgenerated and optimal design for a very simple design space. So this is just two, continu uh, two uh, continuous factors. And I fit a full quadratic model with all interactions and um, I'm sorry, a full inter linear model with all interactions and quadratic effects. So we see that with a, uh, and the quadratic effects are there to detect uh, curvature. So whether, you know, something's linear or not. So we see with a D-optimal design, we tend to, and the size of the circles are also indi indicative of how many points were placed at that particular um, uh, particular test point. So we see here we have, uh, the most of the points are put at the edges um, with a few put in the center, and that's just so we can actually fit the model. But generally speaking, to get the most sort of out of assuming a linear effect, the optimal designs will put most of the points on the exterior of the space. High optimal designs um, uh, minimize the average prediction variance. Um, and they're best if you want to make sort of predictions across the space. Um, and as opposed to de optimal designs, they tend to put more, most points on the interior because when you estimate a point on the edge, and let's say that is the edge of your test space, you only care about the stuff on the interior of that, so you're, you're getting better prediction variance outside of the space, but you don't care about that. So what I-optimal designs uh, tend to do is they tend to put most points in the interior of the space because those tend to give you sort of overall, lower the overall prediction variance across all of the design space. Um, so we see here when we do this sort of process with a simple model, uh, it's sort of the inverse of the de-optimal design. We tend to put the few, fewest points on the exterior, and for the interior points, we put a lot of points because those tend to lower the average prediction variance more. And a lot of what traditional DOE, they, they had sort of ad hoc methods of like, 
uh, central composite design. Oh, you just throw a couple extra points if you have in the center. This just formalizes that, and you don't have to sort of make those decisions or get a statistician to come up with that exact allocation for you. This, you know, uses algorithms and math to do that, so which is one of the benefits of optimal DOE. Yes. Yeah, so uh, each run is a replication. So here we have, uh, yeah, at, at each point that is replicating that specific uh, combination of test factors. That's the and so here we have. Uh, you know, like seven right at the center, and then like you know three at here and two at the edges. But um, yeah, so these are replicates at that point. Okay, and then whatever your number of factors and um, factors and um, levels are, you say it will just give you the design matrix. Yes. And then you just... Yep. Oh, and I'll go into how how we. I'll actually be going through code later that shows you exactly what's going on, so that I think it'll be a little more clear. And then finally, and this is a bit more, uh, this is good if, uh, so we have alias optimal designs. And, and these are a, a little more specific for, um, for compared to these two, which I think are much more common situations. But let's say you are running a, a, a strategy of sequential experimentation. So you have a really big model and you want to, uh, to, to fi figure out which terms are actually active because you can't run a full test design with a, the big model because it would just be too expensive. One way to um, reduce the number of resources required is the first run what's called a screening design. So a design that's just meant to determine which effects are active. You run that, you then follow it up with a much more focused targeted design just on the effects you determined was active. And this can enable you to have potentially uh, more efficiently use resources. Um, so these are usually have less power than, uh, than other methods because they exchange the really good estimates for the parameters for this really nice correlation structure. But um, I just the main thing I want you to notice about this is that this design here is actually the same as the D-optimal design. And that's because we actually oftentimes will have a lot of overlap between the various optimality criteria because a lot of times, you know, a, a, the, the best example of this is a full factorial design. Uh, that design is is basically best in all, all metrics because it has such good or, uh, for for alias and D because it has a really perfect it has a perfect correlation structure and it's also the best design you can get from a D optimality point of view. So if you have certain experimental goals and for specific models and test regions, you'll often have a lot of overlap. Um, and and that's because you know oftentimes this balance idea really wins out over everything. Um, in that like the best the balanced design is usually the best design for multiple factors. The other thing I just wanted to note is that all these have different computational costs. Uh, the way I like to look at it is D-optimality is pretty much instantaneous. This also depends on the size of your design and everything. Bigger designs are going to take longer. Bigger candidate sets or uh, design spaces are going to take longer. But I tend to look at it as you know, D-optimal, you can do it pretty much instantaneously. Um, I-optimal is like you know, check your email. And alias-optimal is go get a cup of coffee. Um, so that, that's what we're talking about. And, and uh, generally speaking, though, for this, these algorithms run fast enough where even the longest ones, you know, you're, you're not talking about having your computer completely stall out for days. A lot of cases, the search process is fairly quick. So here's a concrete example of what I talk, what I'm talking about when it comes to uh, alias optimal versus uh, D optimal. So here on the left, we have a D optimal design. This is 12 runs for six uh, two level factors, and we see here we have this. This is called a correlation plot. So each color here is uh, giving the correlation between that model term. So we have two-factor interactions, and we have our main effects right there. And what we want, if we're running, let's say, a screening design, is we want to be able to tell the difference between all the various, or, or, or distinguish between all the various different effects from the main effects in the two-factor interactions, because we want to be able to figure out which terms are actually active in the model. So, and whether you know main effects are correlated, you see here, here, over here with uh, two-factor interactions, because if they are, what happens, we run this design, and we find that some of those are significant, is they could actually not be significant, but we have this correlation that induces the significance, and then our screening experiment is sort of ruined. Now, you can see here with the alias optimal design, we have this beautiful correlation structure, no correlation between any main effects and two-factor interactions. And that's great if you run this design, because now you know if you detect significance in any of these terms, you are going to be able to say, yes, this is not due to some correlation between main effects and two-factor interactions. These are actually active or not. 
Um, and that's really powerful. This is actually what's called a definitive screening design that was generated algorithmically using Skipper. The one other thing you note is here we have the power values computed for this design. So you see here we have this, you know, 0.969. And the one exchange you get is for alias optimality designs, we see we actually get slightly lower power. And that's sort of the trade space here, is we get slightly lower power uh, with the for most of the terms. But for that, we get this beautiful correlation matrix. So these are the kind of discussions and analyses you do as you go through your, your DOE process. So all that. Why do we want to use Skipper for optimal design of experiments? Uh, so we have uh, lots of software out there that does, uh, you know, DOE work. You can do, um, you know, we use Jump a lot here around here. But why do we want to use Skipper specifically? Um, so first of all, Skipper was really designed, um, you know, by testers, for testers, by people doing the exact kind of workflows we do here in the test community um, to uh, solve those sort of hard questions. Um, and what that means is we don't have a lot of like extra features and functionalities to support like randomized control trials for you know big pharmaceutical companies or other sort of uh, other you know clients, let's say, of these companies that you know have lots of other goals. Skipper was designed to do the sort of DOE work you know often we face in you know the DoD and related communities of, 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 for test and evaluation. So all the features support that workflow, and, and they're really not too many extraneous features that you have to sort of get confused about when you're working. They, they all support that DOE workflow we see very often. Um, it's end-to-end. -end. So it doesn't just, so other software suites sometimes do the you know, analysis portion, but not the design generation, or they do the design generation, but you know, they don't have really robust suites for power analysis. And Skipper does both, and it's tightly integrated. Um, and design specifically easy to use to go straight from generating and value, evaluating design um, in, in just like a line or two of code. So it's very straightforward to use and super powerful uh, for this Monte Carlo power interface uh, because it allows you to do basically things that you can only do with scripting in other, or, uh, in other languages or buying like the $10,000 Pro version. Um, since it's open source, unlike other software, you can actually go into Skipper and see exactly what it's doing. If you're making, you know, billion dollar, you know, hundred million dollar, ten million dollar, one million dollar, it's all lots of money decisions on testing. It's really nice to be able to have somebody who's knowledgeable go in and look and see what sort of assumptions are being made to come up with those decisions, which are ultimately used to allocate your test resources. Um, so you can look at the code and see exactly what we're doing, and and. Uh, and that's really, I think, powerful because oftentimes I've run into bugs in other software where something happens, and you know, we send out something to the to the to the help people there, and they're like, "Oh yeah, no, you just wait till the next version. We have that fixed." I, I nobody sent me a message saying this, you know, this is an error or something. So that's, I think, really powerful. And then finally, um, in addition uh, to being open source and free, which is great, um, you also have, uh, if, let's say, you don't want to actually use you don't want to learn R. If, if you're like, I, I'm, I just, I don't want to do that. Like, I just want to stick with a GUI interface. It does actually come with a GUI interface, which we see here to the right. Um, that sort of allows you to perform a, a pretty robust, slightly limited, but pretty robust uh, access to all the functions and feature, features in Skipper. Um, it allows you to generate designs, evaluate designs, share designs, and, and do all of that. So even if you don't want to, you don't care about coding, you don't want to code, you don't want to learn how to code, you can host this on premises on your laptop. Um, you could have it hosted out in the, in, in the open because um, it's all publicly released, FYI. So, so you can use this and, and access it. Um, and you could then just do your analysis purely based on the GUI. And, and that I think uh, is super you know, convenient. If you could do a GUI in the middle of like a, a, a meeting where you're discussing, or sorry, a, a, a DOE in the middle of a meeting when you're discussing something, like that's how straightforward and simple it is to use. But in case you do want to learn R, which I highly recommend. Um, so here I have uh, on the Skipper's data walk, data, uh, DataWorks workshop website, we have this um, uh, R basics tutorial. I'm not actually going to go through this particular one uh, because it, it does, it, if you do know anything about R, it's just, it'll be super boring. If you don't know anything about R, it'll be a fire hose. Um, so what I'm going to do is provide you with this link. Um, if you want to learn more about it, this basically walks through all the basic features you need to use R um, in the context of Skipper, so not anything extra. And, and what it basically tells you how to do is how to install packages, so install software, install Skipper, 
um, how to create and assign vectors, uh, numeric, categorical, and, and uh, how to go through and use for loops to automate tasks, you know, if you're doing iterative tasks over and over again. Um, it explains data frames, how to manipulate data frames. Data frames, if you don't know, are just the tabular data format available in R, so they're how you, you express tabular data. Uh, how to generate candidate sets. We'll, we'll see this in the code. Uh, basically, expand.grid allows you to quickly produce every single com combination of various input factors, which you then feed to generate test designs. The uh, most esoteric thing is, think, is, I think, R's formula interface. So it explains that in, in some detail, how to specify your model, specify interactions, um, stuff like that. Uh, how to use the R pipe. This is sort of optional, but it's just nice to be able to chain together a bunch of function calls. We'll see this once or twice in the code. It's just a way of passing the output. Uh, it's like a design to the uh, power evaluation functions without having to save a bunch of temporary variables. And then finally, and probably the most important thing, it, it just shows you how to set a seed and what that means. So that means uh, if you want to uh, have a reproducible workflow, you're going to want to control the stochastic behavior of your R session. To do that, you set your random seed, and then each time you run that with that random seed in the future, you get the same outputs. So that is my high-level introduction. Are there any Zoom questions? Great. Any questions from the audience? So you, I saw you had a power associated with your factors. Uh -huh. And so, um, so I guess what that means is like for that particular factor, if your power is, is high, or reasonably high, say whatever you specify, sure. then you're saying that if you find that that factor is statistically significant, Right, so the question is, if you have high power, you can, uh, uh, if that power is high, you'll, you'll feel good that when it's statistically significant that that is an actual effect. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that, that's, and yeah, we'll go over a little bit. When we get to the power session, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about power. But yes, that, that's true. We do have a Zoom question. Oh. Slate breaking. Uh, will setting the seed give the same design across different R versions? Yes. As, as long as you, well, so the, as long as you're above R 3.6, in which, if before 3.6, the random behavior changed. Um, so if that 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 version is like from the late 2010s, um, I believe. I believe so. That that's uh, I think the one caveat. And then you can set a setting to make sure it, it does the same way um, as in those that previous version. But yeah, out of the box, if you're using a, a you know within the last six seven year version of R, it should be fine. Okay. So now let's uh, talk about using uh, Skipper for DOE. Oh, yes, question back. Yeah, um, would, do you have any uh, good resources just for an intro to DOE itself? Like, you have the book for, for R, but for the process of DOE just in general as like a beginner tutorial? Uh, so there, one, one thing I recommend, so one, um, there, uh, we did write a, this is sort of mid-level because we have, I wrote a paper on Skipper so it's in the context of the software skipper, but it does walk through a lot of power analysis in, in, in sort of a not really, really, really low level, but not high level either, sort of mid-level way. Um, so there's a Journal of Statistical Software, George. I don't know if you could put that link in the Zoom or something, or um, it'll be a link at the end. You, you can just see it there. Uh, but uh, that sort of provides like a, like a mid-level for like very low level. Um, I don't know. what. Yeah, Oh yeah, there's a book. Uh, yeah, G G O O S and Hanshin. Yeah, I, I don't know how to spell the, the last one, but they do provide, and that it gives a um, that book particularly provides a nice sort of uh, case study view, like walking you through like your analysts discussing an actual uh, DOE, and it is actually great because it does walk you through a lot of these issues, and then has like little sidebars to sort of explain. The more complex stuff, but when you're reading through it, it's very straightforward. So yeah, that, that is a very good one. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, great. Uh, so let's talk about uh, using Skipper for DOE. Um, oh, it's Goose and Jones. Yeah, Goose and Jones. Yeah, it's Bradley Jones. So. Uh, so let's actually talk a little bit about the specifics of what in is included in Skipper. Um, and what functions you actually work with. So the basic workflow in Skipper um, is you generate a candidate set. So it, you basically create every single point that could potentially be a test point with expand.grid. So that just creates a, a full list of all the different combinations of all your input factors. Then you pass that candidate set 
to uh, gen design that generates your optimal design for your specific model and number of runs. And then finally, you evaluate that design statistical power using either a val design, which does a parametric uh, power calculation like you get if you use jump before. That's what you get out of jump. And you can pass the same designs from skipper into jump back and forth. You'll get the same numbers. Or you can use a val design MC. MC stands for Monte Carlo. That is the really, really great interface, uh, flexible and, and adaptable for doing these sort of analyses for nonlinear responses. Um, and that is, uh, I'll talk about the value of, of that later. So you can do this alternatively, and this is something new in like the last few months. Um, you can also then just create that candidate set and then pass that to this calculate power curves function. And this is great because it automates generating and evaluating the designs iteratively. So let's say you don't care about the specific designs. You're not like coming up with a actual test cards to give to the operator to say, this is how you're going to run the design. You just want to do this high level analysis for these are the various design sizes and powers. You can uh, pass this in uh, along with your model and num number of runs you want to look at to calculate power curves. And that will give you beautiful, nice curves that show how the power changes versus effect size versus uh, your number of trials for all the different model terms. It's for effect power, for parameter power. It's, it's really great. And finally, if you just don't want to work in code at all, there is the GUI, um, which I will now uh, dive into. So um, although a lot of this workshop is specifically about the benefits of a re reproducible workflow um, and how to generate and evaluate optimal designs and code, uh, so this is definitely the easier way, if you, especially if you're just getting started. So when I was writing Skipper, um, I realized it was really quite an ask to get people who are, let's say, used to the point and click interface to transition. I mean, DOE is hard enough on its own, but say, OK, let's do DOE, but also make it so you don't have a really nice interface that shows you, you know, automates the entire process. You have the infinite possibilities of, you know, a, a blank slate of a code in front of you. Uh, and, and, and we think that's better. Um, so doing that, I thought it was really great to, let's say, have an intermediate interface, uh, a GUI, um, not working entirely in code, but uh, also getting the benefits of operating with this, you know, flexible open source tool. Um, and thankfully, R actually has a really great interface for doing, uh, for making these HTML applications called Shiny. Um, and so we made this GUI uh, for Skipper in Shiny and allows you to create sort of uh, nice GUI interfaces for any R code. Um, so not only that, but also we included uh, in this GUI the ability to actually uh, sort of learn R as you're using it. Um, so let me actually show some of that. Um, let's exit out. And I'm going to make sure to share. Uh, I'm going to bring up this. So this is the one live demo portion of the talk. Uh, let me then share this specific screen. OK. Here we go. Share. All right. OK. So everyone can see this? OK, great. So this is Skipper GUI. Um, and this is just the nice you know, HTML interface for generating and evaluating desi the designs. Um, we see here we have two different panels. Um, we have this left panel where we put in our inputs. And then we have this right panel over here where we have our results. So um, here, let's say we have a little design right here. Let's say um, I uh, can go over to this panel and I can say, let's say we have three factors. Uh, so I have three factors here. I can change the name of this. So I'll say temperature. I'll say it goes from 0 to 100. Uh, I'll say speed. Uh, I'll say 450 to 550. And then we'll make a categorical factor here. And we'll call this uh, mode. And we'll call low, mid, uh, so this is, you know, I, I don't know exactly what this test is for. Let's say, you know, we're cooking. Um, I don't know why speed would be there. We're, we're, we're cooking at altitude in an aircraft. And we want to bake the best cookies, which you might think that's, I, I've actually been in, in, in an aircraft before where uh, a P8, they, have a, they had an oven and they, they bought up break, baked cookies in the middle of a test, very long test. Um, so this is something, that, that's what you were doing. We're optimizing our cookie baking experience at, at altitude and speed. 
Uh, so let's generate a design based on we have our three factors. We have our model here. Let's make this a full quadratic model. So I'm actually, so this dot operator, so these are the kind of things that you learn if you actually went into the, um, to the learning about R. But this dot operator, all that means is that's a sub in for basically all the linear terms. So we'll, we'll see what the, I'll show that, uh, demonstrate that a little better later. But what this dot times dot means is we're just having a full model with all main effects plus all interactions. So I generate this, and we get this sort of uh, random looking design. Um, but what we can do is let's order this design. And we see we actually have a beautiful structure. This is a full factorial model given these inputs. We have our low and high temperature, low and high speed, and nested with each one of those, we have each of our three modes. And so we see here we had three breaks. So technically we had a center point, but we know for de-optimal designs, which the default here is, we tend to choose all the points on the exterior. So it ignored those center points when generating this design. So we have this, this is nice. Um, we can also go to this advanced pane. This is where we choose, let's say, eye optimality. We'd increase the number of searches. We'd include some other stuff. Um, but now we have this design, so let's evaluate it. So we want to evaluate power for you know, baking our cookies. So to do that, we just click evaluate design, and we have power. So here we have various power values. So here we're using uh, an alpha of two, or of alpha of 0 0.5, so it can, testing to a significance of, of five, um, 5%. And we have our SNR of two. We'll explain a little bit more of what those mean when we get to the power portion. But we see here we, we really don't have great power. You know, 0 0.29, 0 0.4, that, that's not great. Um, now often in the, uh, here, well, when we first start, so one thing to do if you don't have enough power, first thing you might want to do is, you know, increase your number of runs. So let's say I increase our number of runs to 18 now. So now we have some interesting structure here. Um, it's not exactly a really nice model, but uh, let's see if now we evaluate power and we still see, okay, this is not great. You know, we're still not getting, um, we're still not getting 0.8 power, which we're trying to achieve in all of our factors. So then we say, you know, actually we, we don't need to test this. You know, it's not super important to know with, you know, 95% confidence that our cookies are being baked correctly. So we're going to change our alpha to 0 0.2, um, which means we have eight, we're, we're going to 80% confidence. So we evaluate the design here, and look, we have greater than 90% power. In fact, we're overpowered. We can probably save some runs and go back down to some, some other value. So down here, we have some other diagnostic. We have this correlation map, which you saw earlier. We have this uh, something called a fraction design space plot and some other sort of uh, design search diagnostics. So this is great. This is actually very equivalent to all the things you'd get in jump. If you, if you calculated these, we have you know effect power, parameter power. But let's say instead of looking at, you know, cookie quality as, as a continuous metric. Let's say you're just interested in, you know, did the cookies burn? Did, did the cookies, you know, did, did the cake rise? Uh, then we're going to deal with a binomial, a logistic regression where we have a probability. And let's say the requirement is a 90% chance that the cookies baked correctly. Here, we want to now fit a logistic regression. So let's say we go down here and we choose a binomial response and we want to test the difference between the probability of 70% uh, to 90%. So we want to see if a individual factor changes the probability that will, a cookie will come out correctly down from 90% to 70%. So let's evaluate this design here. So what this is doing down here, you can see this is actually running through a Monte Carlo simulation. It's not that slow. It, it's reasonable. We get this. And oh my god, we have zero power. Why do we have zero power? Well, we give us a nice little error here. Partial or complete separation likely detected in binomial Monte Carlo simulation, uh, basically saying that we have uh, an issue fitting the model. And that's this is a degenerate issue that you often encounter when you have uh, a binomial uh, models or logistic regression. So really, the, the there, there's a couple ways to handle this, but the, the by far the best way is just to increase your number of runs because it really is a case where you just don't have enough runs. So let's say we do that. Uh, let's go and generate our design. And so we have 256 runs. So pretty quick, you know, we're, we're talking with, this is very fast. And now we evaluate this again, simulation, pretty fast. We go through, we simulate power for this much larger design. This is far more cookies. And here we see, oh, great. Our, our power uh, is actually pretty good. Now, if we ran this again, we would see this be a slightly different number each time because this is a Monte Carlo power interface, meaning it's using random sampling to compute these numbers. Uh, but we see here, this is really great because it's actually computing uh, power 
based on using the actual methods you use to analyze the data. So there's no approximations being made here. The only thing you have here is a little bit of sampling noise, which if we went over to this pane, we could in increase, or sorry, power, we could increase the number of simulations and that noise would go down. So if you want to have, if you come up with a design, you say, hey, I just want to be sure that this is you know, right on the edge. I want to make sure it passes. You just increase the number of simulations and that'll give you a much better estimate. So finally, um, so I was changing all these settings this entire time. Uh, we have this pane called generating code. So let's say you know nothing about R, but you want to kind of learn more, or you've been using the GUI, but you find it a little limiting. What you can do is you can actually go to this pane and you can see how, you can see the actual R code being used to generate these plots. So let's say I increase the number of factors. We see here that shows you how the candidate set then also increases. As you, let's say, change the model, let's say I add a quadratic term. So I speed squared. You can see down here, so this expanded that. Um, so now we see this I speed squared uh, included as well. We, this tells you basically how to run this. You can copy and paste this code and have a, re a recorded uh, state of where that design is, and then you can rerun it in the future. And this is really great because I think it really offers somebody like who doesn't know necessarily the hardest part about coding is the infinite possibility of what you can do. Here this shows you exactly what you need to do to get various different inputs. And then finally, um, and uh, what this interface also does that I think is really helpful is it links your final analysis methods to the actual uh, power analysis. So it tells you, given you're doing this power analysis, what does that actually mean you're planning on doing when you analyze the data? Because I think oftentimes people do a power analysis sort of in a vacuum, and then they plan on doing some other sort of analysis when they get the data. This shows you what that analysis is actually valid for, and it gives you the exact uh, R, R function call to analyze your data once you get it. And there's just two quick other things I want to show. Uh, you can actually, if, if you uh, want to save the state, so if you hit this button up here, copy and paste this, open up the, in the future, this will actually stay the exact state of all your inputs um, in this pane, so you can then rerun that. And you, there's actually also this great tutorial that walks you through everything. If this is this is a bit of a fire hose, uh, but you can then go uh, take at your own leisure and walk through this, and, and this will explain all the various features and, and give you some context for each thing. Is so um, that is the GUI. So any questions? Yeah, at the bottom you said that um, it, it gives you information on what you need to do. Yeah. Uh, with your model. That yeah. Um, so let's say you finally get your data, like you, you run your test, you, you, you collect your, out, you know, your actual results of your data. This shows you how given that design and those results, how you actually analyze that data. Because when you do a power analysis, you're, you're assuming a certain method of analysis. So this shows you exactly what that would look like. So in this case, you'd be fitting a generalized linear model with a, binom a, bin a binomial response um, and it shows you the exact model you'd be using and gives you the code. Uh, and it shows you here, we also say, you know, we, we pass this data, uh, this design, and it shows you how to, like, input that design and formula. So it, it just shows you how to analyze your data once you've plugged it. Also, uh, does the code do anything with checking the assumptions? Like, is it part of this data in math, not normal, or? Well, remember, we're dealing with, we're not dealing with, so Skipper doesn't deal with the actual, so the question is whether uh, it deals, Skipper checks for norm normality or other sort of checks on the response. Skipper just deals with the power uh, generate, or the, the design generation and power calculation. When you actually get the data, then you have to do all that. It doesn't deal with the actual data itself. So it just does everything up to the analysis for power, for planning purposes, but, it, but the actual analysis is done using other software suites. Okay, so that's it for the GUI. Um, so now let's get out of here. Let me reshare the screen for this. Okay, so that was the GUI. Um, so now let's talk about uh, optimal design generation. Um, so we kind of went through that a little bit in the GUI, but now we're going to sort of dive in to some concrete examples with code. Um, so here we're going to be during this entire. Let me get rid of this. During this entire. Uh, during this uh, talk, we're going to be using this hypothetical example of evaluating a synthetic aperture radar system. So basically trying to see how the resolution, if you don't know synthetic aperture radar, it's basically a radar that flies around and takes pictures. It shines out radar pulses, gets the information back, combines them all and creates you know, images um, going through like clouds or you can take them from space. And it, it's, it's, it's a just a way of sh shine, using radar as a flashlight to take images. Um, and you, but you uh, do it from like aircraft or satellites. 
Um, so we want to see, have, let's, let's say, a test where we investigate how the resolution changes uh, over, let's say, altitude, or let's say, speed, or uh, SARS have different modes. They have modes that, you know, focus on a single area for a long time, or that scan a large area. So we want to characterize how the resolution changes. So what we, uh, the resolution is specified usually for, for lots of imagery systems in terms of NIRS ratings. So NIRS just stands for National Imagery Interpretability Rating Scale. It's just a number, a continuous metric that corresponds to resolution. So that's going to be our continuous response. But let's say we also had a programmatic requirement that an operator was able to correctly classify an aircraft based on this imagery at some certain probability. Um, that would be a binomial response. Um, and to actually investigate that, we would have to do a, a different type of power analysis. So we're going to have, let's say, these two different types of analyses that we're going to run and generate uh, power evaluations and designs for. So the basic API for gen design looks like this. We have a candidate set. So we see here, um, I, I haven't included the, the middle point for mode just to have it fit in the slide, but we have here every combination of altitude, mode, and speed. Um, and we feed that in along with our model and our number of trials that we, our resources, uh, into gen design. And then output comes our optimal design. Now you can see here that even though we have three points, a center point for speed, because it's optimal, we don't use that point and we choose only ex the exterior points. Um, so what is going on in the background for uh, what Skipper is actually using is something called, this is a little technical detail, but it, it helps provide context when you're searching for designs. It does something called a hill climbing algorithm where it basically just continuously searches through the candidate set and repeatedly uh, loops through it and exchange makes exchanges into your uh, design to improve the design. Every single time it finds something that would make your design better, it subs in that run. And, and it loops through and does this over and over again until the design doesn't improve anymore. And then it says, okay, I found an optimal design. However, uh, because this is sort of a stochastic process and uh, it actually does this multiple times over and over again, each time starting with a random design. Um, and this, uh, so th that's what we see here. We, it's looping through this list of this candidate set of runs. It's subbing in those runs here when it returns green. And then we can see the optimality condition rising as it each make, makes each one of those exchanges. So why it does it multiple times, and this is really the context I want you to take because it actually can affect your design quality. So depending, um, because it's a hill climbing algorithm and we're dealing with an optimiz optimization problem, you have the issue. If, if let's say you started a thousand people at a thousand random points, um, you know, across a mountain range and you said, just keep on climbing up and each person, they keep on climbing up and then they reach their peak and they say, okay, I've, I've reached as far as I can tell. And they're, they're blindfolded. So they're like crawling on their hands and knees. They reach the point and say, I think about the highest point. Uh, oftentimes you see most of these uh, points end up not hitting the actual highest point. That's the equivalent of finding a design that you, it's locally optimal. So let's say you need two exchanges to make it better, but you're never going to do that because we're only exchanging one at a time. What Skipper does is it starts off with a random designs all throughout the space. It has all of these climb up to find the best design, and then it asks all of those different design searches, hey, which one of you is highest or best? And then out of all of those, it will pick the, you know, the best one. And this is important just because when you have a design that has lots of constraints or has a really weird uh, uh, test space or a really complicated model, oftentimes you do have a bumpy sort of uh, space like this where it's really hard to optimize. So um, if you have a case where sometimes you get a different design or you look at the optimality and it it's changing, you might want to just increase the number of repeat searches, and that will improve, generally speaking, your, your design quality. So let me just run to this. I have, a, I have already pre-generated a code demo. So it's here at this Skipper uh, Gen Design. If you go to the website, it's uh, the Gen Design website. So here, let's go. And this is a good point, because we are about halfway through our talk. Uh, I am going to go to Design of Experiments, and here, and all right, so here we're actually going to be, so this originally was a live demo, but live demos are awful um, because things just tend to go wrong and then everyone's just sitting here looking at me. So I ran a live demo ahead of time. Um, so here we're, we're seeing uh, all the code. So this is just the code that I've run and the outputs are right below it. So you could run this on, on your own and you'll get the exact same thing. Um, so here, uh, what I'm doing is I'm, uh, so we have our SAR example, and uh, what I want to do is I want to generate a candidate set. 
uh, for this. So here, I'm actually generating a much more coarse candidate set. Uh, so here we have altitude. So this produces a data frame, um, which we see down here, um, where we have every single combination of altitude, speed, uh, mode, and target environment. So uh, we see here we have uh, three. We have our three spot modes. We have our target environment with two different kinds, and we have a uh, uh, our, our various speeds. And, and in this case, we're saying also um, target environment is going to be a hard to change variable, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So this is what this actually looks like. So this is this data frame that's printed out. We can see here we actually uh, have a sort of nested structure. Every single combination and or combination of these uh, various speeds, we have our three altitudes. Each one of those, we have a different speed. Um, each group of speeds, we have one scan, and, and, and we have this sort of uh, structure uh, of, our, of every single combination of these terms. That's all expand.grid does, is it just takes all your inputs and outputs a, a, a data frame of every combination. So let's say we actually make this, so that was in, in steps of 10,000 in altitude and 50 in, uh, in speed. Let's say we make this a lot more fine-grained because we actually want to, you know, we, we can go to very specific speeds or very specific altitudes and we want to find the best design. So here, in, instead of 10,000, we go by steps of 1,000 and by steps of 5 in speed. And we look at this, and now this was 54 runs. This, this new candidate set is now 2,646. So it's, it's a lot larger. I didn't want to print this out because I'd be scrolling for a while. So uh, let's first uh, generate a design with absolutely no constraints. So this would be like the, the class classical design space where you could you know, go wherever you want, operate. You know, we could operate at 10,000 feet or 30,000 feet at zero speed. That's or, you know, 450 or whatever. So here, what we're going to do is we're first going to set a random seed. So this just makes sure that everything we run after here, we can reproduce later. Um, and this can just be a random number. Um, and we specify our candidate set that we just specified. Here we specify a model. So this squared term right here, all this does is says we want all the main effects and all the interactions between all of those main effects. Here we specify our number of trials, that'd be 24. That's our number of runs. And this randomized and false, this actually, by default out of Skipper, the designs are randomized. So this just orders it because it makes that a little easier to parse and read to see what the structure is. So we do that. And then we see here is our resulting structure. So we see we have uh, a group of 12 runs at altitude 10,000, 12 at altitude 30. Then nested within that, we have six runs at uh, 450, six at 550. And then we have this duplicated scan strip spotlight. So very similar to the GUI design we, we had. And because it, it each um, because we have basically two continuous factors and one three-level categorical, the full factorial for that design is actually 12 runs. So this is just a replicated full factorial design generated algorithmically because Classical designs are just the optimal designs that you know statisticians could find with pen and paper. So we just generated those designs with an algorithm. Um, so here we look at the optimality, and because this is a full factorial design, it is the best design you can get. So it is 100% de-optimal, 100% a-optimal. Um, that's the prediction variance and some other stuff that we're not really going to talk about. But if you're a statistician, you might be interested in it. We can also plot this design space. So I'm going to show these plots a lot. And what this is, is just each of these red points is the actual test, is, uh, the point that was chosen in the design space. And all of the black dots are the candidates. So th those are potential test uh, points you could choose. So we see here, uh, we've uh, split this across the three modes. And we see, uh, because this is a de-optimal design, we chose the corners of the space. And we chose it to be balanced between all three factors. So. Um, this is uh, not a surprise because balanced designs generally are good designs. And this is actually the, uh, the, the classically optimal design. Um, and just an, as another note, that randomization doesn't affect the design quality. That, that's something about test execution and ensuring that when you analyze the data, you're not inducing some correlation. But you can change the order of the runs however you want. Doesn't matter when it comes to design quality. You're still going to get the same power numbers as long as you don't have blocking. Obviously, but blocking is another issue. But um, but generally speaking, the order doesn't matter. So these designs um, really just are kind of stand on their own, um, depending on just actually what's in them and not the order you run them in. So let's say instead of uh, this, you know, hypothetical super, you know, free design, we actually are constrained to work in a constrained candidate set. So we, we have this flight envelope that we have to generate our test points to remain within. 
Um, here, what I've done is, uh, and I explained this a bit in the R tutorial, uh, how, to, how to filter runs to, for your candidate set. So if you're interested in that, um, just look at that document. That explains it a bit. But here I'm just basically saying, hey, filter that candidate set that was unconstrained to fall within this region. So I gave it a series of constraints, and I filtered it down to that. So here we see our constrained uh, space that we're actually wanting to generate our test points in. So we, we saved this to the uh, to the data frame constrained candidate set by filtering out the runs that don't, uh, only the runs that match our conditions. And now we take that constrained candidate set and we generate the exact same design. So we just go through that process again. And here is the design. We see now we have some slightly different things. We, we have um, you know, our altitude ranges 10,000, 10, 14, 20, 28. Just looking at the design doesn't really sort of indicate any particular structure although we can see some, and we see we, we still do have even distributions between all of the modes. But if we plot this, so here, and we, we see the, because we're not operating this ideal space now, our, our de-optimality is now lower. Um, we, it's no longer the perfect, our de-efficiency is no longer 100, which is perfectly efficient, but some other values. So that's the, that, that is what um, often we have these constrained spaces. You're not going to get like the hypothetical best design, but that's because that design doesn't exist. So here we have the actual uh, list of points. So we see um, we are actually so, sort of choosing the edges of the candidate set here. Um, what we define as, an, before we were choosing the corners here, and, and this is sort of the corners of this space. But you might note that we also have this like, corner right down here, but that corner doesn't really, isn't selected because it's, uh, I guess, not that different enough from these corners up here and doesn't provide the same amount of information. Oh, sorry, yes, uh, sorry, these, these corners, yeah, good, good point. These corners right here um, are not, uh, yeah, not selected because they, they aren't, uh, I guess, different enough. So it chooses uh, the sort of best, most optimal corners to choose. And it does this algorithm, so you, you, know, you don't have to kind of figure out what is best. It, it's doing this for you. But it sort of makes sense. Like these are like, yeah, that, that's kind of the corners of the space. Um, but let's say instead of just, so this is best, this design is best if you're trying to make predictions, um, or no, sorry, if you're trying to make, characterize the space. Uh, but let's say you want to make, um, you want to understand the average prediction variance within the space. You want to characterize curvature. Let's say you think there is a sweet spot of resolution. So let's say high resolutions, you're, you know, you're, you're too far away from the ground. Low resolutions, you're getting like masking because you have like objects that are giving long shadows. So let's say you think there's going to be some region or some speed that provides the best Near's uh, resolution. You want to find that so you can then, you know, recommend the operators like, yeah, flight at this resolution um, for or for that resolution for that particular mode or something. So to do that, we um, we want to uh, uh, come up with a design specifically for you know finding optimizing that particular experimental goal, which is different from characterizing it because we're going to use this to predict points away from our test points, so within the interior of the space. So that's a different experimental goal. Um, so to do that, we're going to add a quadratic effect. So that's done with this i uh, key here, or this i function. Um, and what this does is it's just called the as is operator. It's just saying, hey, evaluate this expression within there as an actual expression in it and not as part of the formula. Because we saw earlier the, the caret operator taking something to the power was also in the formula interface also means to give like interactions between terms. So we're saying, uh, just like, give me the actual numeric squared version. This is the equivalent of if you just created a new column or a new test uh, or column in your matrix that was just, uh, you know, speed times speed, and you called it speed squared. That's all that this function is doing. It, it, it's just the doing that shorthand for you so you don't have to create a new column in your matrix. So we create this new column, and we're saying uh, we are looking at both uh, speed and altitude squared. And we still have the 24 runs. So let's see what that gives us. Uh, so we see we actually get some center points, um, but also some points in the center on the edges. But one thing you might notice is this design doesn't seem very balanced. Um, we actually have, uh, between each mode, it's not really balanced in, in the points that are chosen. And, and that's one indication. I mean, we're going to talk about power later, and that's how we really evaluate designs. But when you see an unbalanced design like this, you, you can take it as an indication that you probably need more runs because especially when you're doing prediction across the space. So we're actually going to uh, add more runs and see how this changes. 
Yes. And how are you defining balance? So I'm, I'm defining, so how, the question is how am I defining a balanced design? And I mean, across all the factors, so in this case, we have three factors, and we see that across those three factors, we aren't getting the same points. So unlike the previous version where each factor, we had similar test points for like the continuous factors, here we see we are actually seeing different points being chosen for each mode. So that's just one indication, especially if you're doing prediction across the space, that you might want to increase the number of runs and see, it, you probably could improve the design a lot. So that's what we do now do. We uh, triple our number of runs to 72, exact same model. Um, note we're still setting the same seed because we want to you know, be finding, uh, running through a similar search process each time. And we see now when we increase the number of runs, we get almost a perfectly balanced design. Um, but you know, we, we do still have some other points because it chose to allocate some points in a way that actually did sort of give you a better design than it being perfectly balanced. Um, this is where the kind of weird sort of, uh, you wouldn't you know, think to put this little point right here, but apparently adding that point, and, and, I, and I ran through this a bunch of time, this is very consistently puts a point there, but that provides you know, a better prediction than points off center. You also might have seen this in jump. Jump does this a lot where you'll have center points and then it'll give you a point at like point, you know, point zero 0.04 or something like very slightly far away from the center or away from a point. And, and it's doing that because it says, you know, figured out that actually this gives you slightly better prediction variance. Um, the difference here in Skipper is it uh, only does that for the points that you allow. So it doesn't give you, if you know, it, it's not going to say run it at, you know, altitude of 124 or 1,224.973 feet because that's optimal. It's going to say, hey, you, you said 1,200 feet was a or twelve thousand feet was a good number. I chose that. Um, so th it, it it still is keeping in consideration your list of available test points. But we see this is much more balanced. We see here now we have you know it's choosing the same corners, it's choosing the same edge points, and it, it's allocating it a little bit differently. But uh, generally speaking, we're kind of uh, symmetrical on, on all the three modes. So that that, that that's an indication uh, that you're probably um, exploring the space pretty well. And what we do see here is as we increase the number of runs, we see. What, what's going to happen is it's just going to replicate more points at these runs. Um, generally speaking, when you reach the point where you're not adding new points to new areas, uh, as you add more runs, you're just going to continue uh, replicating those points um, for, for these, uh, usually for these I-optimal designs. So let's, uh, so one caveat I have to say about balance is let's say you are candidate set. So here I added in an additional constraint. I just said that when the mode is spotlight, the altitude, let's say in this case, has to be lower, or we can't go to the max altitude. In that case, you, you might not expect, uh, you shouldn't expect it to be balanced because your candidate set is imbalanced. So when I say look for balance, because that generally means a good design, or if, if you do have an unbalanced candidate set, we see here obviously like this is not, not producing uh, balanced designs, it's not putting the center point in. That's, th this, that, that, what I'm saying about balance is more just like a rule of thumb. Um, for increasing the number, but it, you don't necessarily look for it in all cases. Okay, so th these were all D-optimal designs. Um, but let's say we, yeah, we want to predict, uh, we want to find that sweet spot in the nearest score. Um, so in that case, it's often best to use an I-optimal design because I-optimal designs minimize that prediction variance. So they give you better model predictions across the space. Uh, so here I've generated an I optimal design. The only difference is I said optimality is equal to I. Um, and we see here, uh, so this is the I optimal design. This is the I optimal design, and here's the D optimal design. So we see the prediction variance, which is what this I uh, uh, number is, is lower for the I optimal design, which is what we expect. But we also see the D optimality is lower, meaning we're not, uh, we have higher variance on, you know, characterizing, or less ability to characterize the performance across the space, but we do decrease uh, this uh, prediction variance. So let's see exactly which points are chosen. So these, this is our original design. This is just the balanced three-level quadratic D-optimal one. And let's see what happens. And we see we, we have part, uh, particularly focusing on these edge points. So for the I-optimal design, uh, we get something slightly different. Uh, now we're actually putting lots of points on these uh, edges. Um, and this uh, really helps. And, and not in a way that you necessarily you'd figure out you um, on your own, but this is what it's determined to be, you know, give you the best prediction variance across this non-linear, uh, non-ideal space. And this is what uh, op or optimal designs are really good at doing, is if you have some sort of space like this that you're trying to, you know, create the best design considering some, like, goal, like, prediction variance, 
there's going to be no closed form way of doing that. You could do that with like rules of thumb, but here you're 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 algorithmically finding something that is best. Um, and by increasing the number of repeat searches, you can be more confident, um, especially if you get the same design over and over again, that that one is the globally optimal design. So the thing is about looking at balance and everything is it, it, that that's just kind of a, a, a rule of thumb for like exploring the space, but we actually need to evaluate these designs and see if they fit our experimental purpose. Um, so in this case, for i-optimal designs, we want to look at to see how the average, not only the, the average value, but sort of how the prediction variance varies across the space. Um, and we can do this with using what's called a fraction of design space plot. So this is also in jump, if you've seen it. But it, it basically tells you uh, it, what proportion of the space lies below some uh, prediction variance. And if you have some regions that have maybe very high prediction variance and some regions with very low, ideally, um, so let me show you an example. Um, so ideally, and let me actually just pull this up into two new tabs just so we can compare them. So we're comparing here our D-optimal and our I-optimal uh, design for average prediction variance across the space. So this plot just tells you that that red vertical line tells you where uh, uh, and the, the where the average prediction variance is. So um, at half the design space and the horizontal line tells you what that value actually is. So if we go here and compare the D-optimal, so here uh, to the I-optimal, we see that the I-optimal design is better in all ways. It has better average prediction variance. So we see the average prediction variance, the horizontal line goes down. And it also has better maximum prediction variance. So there are regions in the D-optimal design where the variance is very high when you make model predictions. And uh, basically being like points that are far away from any of your test points. And those, uh, because we put more interior points for the I-optimal design, we minimize those really bad regions. So there's some, that, that enables you to be more confident knowing that, you know, your maximum prediction variance is below some certain level. When you actually use that to predict, you can say, okay, I, I have a good idea of what the worst case scenario is for this design. So here we have our various values. Um, so any any questions on that, on fraction of design space plots or, or DNI optimal designs? You have a Zoom question. Um, uh, is there a feature that helps you figure out how many runs you need to achieve a goal? Or do you have to do it by hand? Uh, well, so the, the question of, of, you know, what if you have to do it by hand, so I think operating in code by hand is pretty easy because you just hit run for, let's say, let's say you're doing, uh, so calculate power curves, which I'll show in a little bit, that if you're judging your, your design based on power, there's, there's nothing that makes the decision for you. I, I guess that's, that's the big thing. There's nothing saying like, yes, this design is good. You're not going to get your, you know, 06 review uh, from Skipper. It's, it's going to provide you with the things to review later. But no, it's, um, um, I, think, I think maybe your power curves. Yeah, the, the power curve is really what automates sort of a lot of the, the work um, behind doing this. So yes, I, there is that. I'll show off what that is when we get to a design evaluation. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about split plot designs. So split plot designs, basically sometimes you have, in, in this case, we're saying um, target environment is hard to change uh, because when, uh, let's say you can do a bunch of runs where you can quickly speed up the aircraft, slow down the aircraft, move to different altitudes, but let's say flying 30 minutes to get from a desert to an urban environment can cost a lot of money and a lot of time, and you can't do that very frequently. Split plot designs allow you to design considering those restrictions on randomization, basically saying like, you know, I can't, I can't vary this every, uh, every single turn. I can't fly back and forth between like, you know, Las Vegas and, you know, China Lake or something. I, I, I can't do that. So in that case, you would, um, uh, you can use a, a tool called a split plot design. And what that does is it, it enables you to design experiments that give you the most power when you have this restriction. So here, what Skipper, you, you, uh, in Skipper, to do that, what you use, um, what you can use is, uh, uh, oh, how you build these types of designs is you build them with an iterative process. So what you basically do is you go in and you uh, generate a design um, that for those harder to change factors. And then when you do that, what happens is uh, you fix that, and then you design the easy to change factors with those hard to change factors fixed. Yeah, can you talk to her? And what's nice about that is you actually get really nice properties 
uh, based on doing that, and that you're, if you have like interactions between the hard to change and easy to change terms, they're basically easy to change. So you, you get the most powerful out of those interactions. Um, the only downside is you get lower power because you effectively, in this case, we generated eight different blocks, whole plots for this, uh, for this uh, uh, hard to change term. So really you, you kind of only have eight runs. So even though here, so we generate um, our hard to change design first and then, oh, and then we feed that into the uh, into gen design again as the split plot factor. And then we say uh, 64 trials. And what Skipper then does is it takes those and then tries to create a balanced design for all of those split plot factors. So we see here that it creates designs of eight runs. So basically what we're doing here is we're, we're, um, we're just creating in layers. These, we first start off with the hard to change design, and then we fix those in place and we replicate to our number of whole, uh, split plots or, or subplots and we generate our easy to change factors with those fixed. And uh, this ends up with this sort of, um, and we can do this any number of times. So we can create a split plot design with one hard to change factor, or we can uh, feed uh, a split plot design to this again, and then get a split split plot design. And you can do this for whatever, if you have, you know, hard to change, very hard to change, easy to change, medium to change. Um, so that's the really flexible thing about skippers is, is that th this interface allows you to do those things um, uh, pretty easily. and. Uh, here we've also added um, a blocking columns just so you can more easily see the split plot structure. So we see here, this is all one block. So here is our first block all in the urban environment. And then we have the second block here and that continues down. And we see there are blocks of eight because eight, uh, we had eight uh, whole plots and we had 64 runs so that divides evenly. So we get nice even splits, but you can also manually specify if let's say, and we see here, this is the actual design. Um, so it's not completely balanced, but you know, it's, it's, uh, to evaluate this, we'd really want to use power. And, uh, if we, we can also though, let's say oftentimes we'll have some weird restriction on our blocking run. Sometimes you can't have that perfectly even split, or, you know, you can do like six runs here, eight runs here, 12 runs here in groups of those numbers. You can actually specify and generate a design with that weird restriction on, uh, on the block sizes by manually specifying here. So here it no longer just tries to allocate them perfectly among those 64 runs. Uh, here we can see that we have a first block of size four, a second block of size four, then we have this third big block of size 12. So if you have some reason where, you know, some blocks cost more than others, uh, that you, you could account for that by manually specifying those. Yes? So to incorporate blocking, you need to have, turn on the split block design feature. So you need to generate a design, like a hard, just design for your hard to change factors. And then you, yeah, and then you pass that into this split plot design argument. So the actual design you're passing into it. And what it does is it looks at, it's like, okay, you want to fix these factors in place. Your new, your new run has, you know, 64 runs. That means your, your split plot design has eight, we have 64 runs. We're going to allocate that, you know, eight runs per block. And then it'll generate a design with those fixed in place. So that, that's how you can account for that structure. So finally, so that's one uh, place where blocking happens. Um, we also have uh, blocking in design augmentation. Design augmentation is, is sort of the next topic. So we have split plot designs, and what that does is it accounts for that sort of nested structure. Design augmentation is sort of the other thing. So I mentioned earlier the alias optimal designs. Um, and what that is is you, you run like a first design, and then you follow that up with a, a follow-up design for just the factors of interest. In that case, we often have blocking as well because you don't want to throw out that previous test because you're running the test on the same factors. So what you, instead you do is you treat that as one big block and then you use that as information as well when you're analyzing your data for the second block. To generate a design, uh, uh, you, you could do two things. You could either run that screening experiment, throw away all that information, and then generate a design like completely independently of it. That's one way of doing it. Or what Skipper allows you to do with the augment design interface is take that previous design's information and then generate your new design that it takes into account that previous block of information, uh, that those previous runs. And so then it generates new runs no with the knowledge that, uh, with the information that you you know, had a bunch of test points throughout the space prior. It allows you to, to take into account that previous information um, which can be good because sometimes that can save on test resources because you can, you know, do fewer runs if you take into account the previous information. And sometimes if you then, you know, are, are fitting your model, you might choose slightly different points 
um, rather than generating a new uh, uh, a new design completely independently because you already have some information at certain points. So the design generation uh, feature allows you to do that. Or sorry, design uh, augmentation. And the interface is very similar to the split plot design. You just feed the previous design. And instead of fitting just uh, setting those columns, it just basically sets that block of runs ahead of time. And then you regenerate the rest of them below that. Um, so that's all design augmentation is. It's just say, hey, I had a, this previous experiment. I'm going to use it when I analyze your, my final data. But obviously, since I ran this in two very independent testing units, um, I have to account for the fact that you know those would be correlated. Uh, and, and you can do that with the design augmentation. So here is just the, uh, a visual representation. So we have our individual environments, and then we vary everything else in between. And each one of those environments, the, the runs, because you run them, they're not randomized. There could be some correlation. So the split plot structure allows you to account for that correlation. Um, and yeah, this is just a visual representation of what Skipper is doing. So we have each one of these blocks, and you can see that we fix those, then we duplicate those for those uh, target environments. Sorry, I should be pointing here. Uh, and then we also then uh, then generate all these random uh, these randomized terms within that. So these are all you know randomly structured, which is then you you get the most power out of that. Uh, so okay, I explained all those. Zoom questions, great. So finally, okay, uh, which is, is great timing because this is about half an hour before the end. Um, we also have evaluating. So I, I talked basically all these ways about uh, generating um, generating designs. Uh, actually, let me just make sure I didn't. Yeah, that, that's that's fine. There, there might be a little bit more on um, basically. So all I say at the end of that presentation, uh, at the end of that document, I, I believe is uh, you. We we talked about these you know sort of optimality criteria, and everything we use to kind of look at the design quality. However, uh, a design that's optimal is not necessarily adequate for your purpose. To judge adequacy, you need to look at experimental power or some of these other, some other like correlation uh, or depending on your experimental goal. But in this case, uh, power is by far the best way to evaluate whether your design is adequate. Because the optimality is just a mathematical uh, trait of the design itself, but um, it doesn't mean that it's sufficient to support your test goals, your testing goals. So let me um, go. What exactly do I mean by statistical power? Uh, so it's the probability that you will actually find an effect if one exists. Um, so let's say here uh, we have a radar that completely random example detects balloons in your airspace. Um, so let's say a type one error here would be you saying uh, it would be a false positive and saying that yes, you know our radar indicates incoming balloons when none actually exist. Whereas a type two error, uh, beta, which I'll commonly refer to as, uh, would be a balloon does exist. Uh, but uh, your radar says, nope, I, I don't detect anything. Now, um, power is one minus beta. So basically, the more powerful you are, the less likely you are to make this type 2 error, the more likely you are to detect the balloon if it does exist. So we want to have very powerful tests because if there is an effect, we want to be able to see it. Um, so there's a couple of different inputs that affect power. Uh, first of all, we have design size. You have more runs. Generally speaking, you have more power. Um, you have more looks at the uh, and more data to test your hypothesis. Um, you also have design quality. This is the difference between two darts versus eighteen darts and ten versus ten. Uh, the, and this is all that Gen Design really does for you. Is it uh, a better, more optimal design will often have better power uh, than a poorly designed test. Um, so that's what Gen Design allows you to do. It, it gives you designs that are hopefully the best quality that you can achieve. Also, type 1 error rate also influences your power. So if you're more willing to accept a false positive, you are more likely to see when a positive actually does exist. Um, it's just a different type of risk. But uh, if you're saying like, yeah, you know, I'm willing to accept 20% of the time that I say something's you know, a, a positive when it's not, you're going to capture more times where it actually you know, is positive and, and you detected it. Your effect size. So this is the equivalent for this example of uh, having a, a small effect size would be having a very small balloon. So you're trying to detect something with a very small radar cross section versus something with a very large radar cross cross section. So your effect size also uh, changes your ability to detect an effect, um, and 
and larger effect sizes are easier to detect and have higher power. Um, or when you design a test around a larger, larger effect size, it, you have more power to detect that than versus a smaller. And then finally, and this is the part I really want to emphasize in this talk, is your analysis method really matters. Um, so this is uh, something that I also don't think is talked enough when we discuss power. But the specific method you actually use to analyze your power can may have dramatic effects on your power values. So here we have a, a concrete example. So um, we have a test. This is a, a binomial exact test versus a logistic regression. Both of them evaluate a binomial response. In this case, we have a very simple test. It's just two, uh, a two-level factor, which you can analyze with a binomial exact test or a logistic regression. Um, and uh, the issue would be if, let's say, you used a binomial exact test to size your, your actual test because you know it, it has a nice closed form solution. It's easy. It's like a single function. You don't have to do simulations. But then you actually used a logistic regression for binomial, the binomial exact test, you have adequate power at 15 runs. At 15 runs, if you ha use a logistic regression, you have zero power, none, um, or you know, 0.5 or 0 0.05, like nothing. Um, because in this case, you're encountering that issue of, of uh, separation we, we saw in the GUI, and you have you're not even you don't even have your type two error rate. Your, your model doesn't fit the majority of the time. You, to get adequate power with logistic regression, you need 110 runs. That's almost, you know, that, that's like a, a factor of eight more runs. That, 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 that is incredibly, uh, either you would be incredibly overpowering your test and wasting lots of resources or incredibly underpowering it and losing nothing. And either way, you're losing a lot of money because you're running this big test and learning nothing. Or, or you are running it a lot and you're just wasting a lot of resources. So making sure that you match your analysis methods to your power analysis is super important because they can have vastly different values depending on what you choose. And Skipper makes this super easy uh, because you don't have to, this is, this is an eye chart, you, you don't have to memorize this um, because Skipper actually tells you when you analyze your data with the eval design interface which analysis methods you should be using, not only in the GUI but also in code. But depending on your input, so let's say you're doing, you're, you, you evaluate power using the eval design. That, that's assuming a normal response. And depending on whether you're blocking or not blocking, it's assuming that when you analyze the data, you are going to be using the equivalent of one of these functions. Like that is what those power values are valid for. Um, and so we, we talked about the statistical criteria. They're, they're all independent of your analysis method. So you don't have to worry about that when you're generating your design. But when you're evaluating it, it it's super important. So here we have uh, a val design MC, which gives you more ability to uh, look at uh, nonlinear responses such as logistic regression or Poisson regression or exponential regression. And here this is just showing you, and, and with logistic regression you can also do something called a Firth correction. So this just shows you all of the various different things you would actually have to, you know, analyze your data with and what it's assuming you're doing when you hit that button that says, or set that setting that says, yes, do a Firth correction. That means you're no longer fitting it with, you know, GLM. You're fitting it with GLM and you have to specify the method specifically to, to this method. So Linking your uh, your power analysis really is is a two for one deal. It's effectively an analysis plan that shows you that tells you how you're going to analyze your data uh, and and what that power value is good for. Uh, so, but this this is all just printed out in, in Skipper, although it's not printed out here because this is an older output, but it, it's printed out below that. You'll see that in the code. So, uh, the eval design interface. So, this is the parametric power calculation. It's very similar to what you do in Jump, um, and should output the exact same thing. You again, now instead of a candidate set, you're specifying your design, you, you also specify model, and you have your alpha. So you feed that into, and output is power. Um, so let's jump over, hopefully this will go well this time, to the code. So let me go to uh, evaluating experimental designs. Okay, so here uh, we're, we're starting off again, we just load our library, so this is, you can run this independently on your own as well. Um, we just specify some contrast here, this is just because we're running some models a little bit later on and, and basically just it's a way of specifying how you encode your dummy variables. Um, but here we just regenerate our design. Also the other thing um, I did at the end of the previous one that I didn't get to is you can also save your design to a CSV file. So all designs are just, you know, uh, are just tables in R. So I, I just actually here saved it uh, in the previous version to this final uh, design final. And here I can just load it back into R using read.csv. And you can actually load external designs as well. If you have to evaluate something that somebody else gives you a design, you can just read that in R and evaluate it, and it should uh, function as any other design generated in Skipper. 
So here, uh, this is our final design that I generated. It has 72 runs. And so let's say we want to do like a simple analysis like we did in jump. Um, we can do a val design, and we specify our model with all quadratic effects. But here we're saying we want to test a 95% confidence, so we set our alpha to 0 0.5, and an effect size of 2. Uh, so we do that, and we see here we actually don't have adequate power. We don't have 80% power in, in many terms. Um, so we want to you know, uh, you know, increase, let's say, or we want to achieve 80% power. So this design is not adequate. Um, so here uh, we have uh, we have our effect size and alpha. Let me just actually run back to. So for effect size for us, we're going to be talking about uh, our NEARS rating. Um, so for oftentimes in, in, in both jump and skipper, what you do is you specify it in terms of signal to noise ratio. So the noise in this case would be the expected run to run variation. So let's say you expected a noise value of one. So this is fake data that I just made myself. So it's the capital. This is a SAR image. But let's say we expect on a run to run basis, we get about a, vari a variation of one point. But we want to detect, um, in this case, we could say our SNRs2 is what we want to detect, which is we want to detect when it changes by, you know, a, a, this amount of resolution. But for other, um, and that would be a significant effect. Or let's say we are actually interested in one. So we don't want to do the SNR of two. We want to actually detect when it decreases by, you know, one point. Um, so that, that's the linear mo model. But for, let's say, non-linear models like uh, uh, logistic regression or generalized linear models, in that case, you'll often have you specify in terms of like odds ratios or probabilities. But there's other ways. And Skipper allows you to specify those in terms of the actual, you know, probabilities or the actual event rates or things like that. So you don't have to kind of do that weird translation on your own. So here we have, um, that, that's just the sort of example for there. Um, so let's pull up this again. All right, so now we're both seeing that. So let's say we want to then change our effect size to one. This will actually make our power worse uh, because we're decreasing the size of the effect we're actually interested in. You see here, oh, this is awful. We get 0.2 power instead of uh, 0.7. And this means uh, we probably need a much more robust design. So let's say, and, and let's say here, instead, okay, one thing we can do, we're, we're not testing to 95% confidence. Let's say we want to test to 80% confidence, which is often, I think, a lot of test programs, they, you know, they don't have the resources to 95, so they'll test to 80%. So we say, okay, our alpha is 0.2, um, and we regenerate it there, and still, we no longer have uh, adequate power. So what we now have to do is we now have to increase our number of trials. Uh, so we see we do this here. So we're generating a new design, and we're just using this. This all this does is it passes that design straight into a val design and evaluates it. So we now try 100 trials, and nope, uh, we still don't have adequate power. Um, so now let's try 150 trials. We do that, still not adequate power. So 0.72. So finally, at 200 runs, uh, we finally now have adequate power. Here we have. Our lowest power value is 0 0.08, uh, 0.801. So now we, we figured out, okay, with an effect size of one, assuming a confidence of, of 80%, we can now fit our model. We can also note here, this is telling you what the assumptions are made. So this is where it tells you the analysis method. It says if you're going to do parameter power, um, you want to use a linear uh, linear model. And if you're doing effect power, you want to use uh, an ANOVA. Um, we can also include blocking terms. Um, so this is if you're doing a split plot design. It should do this automatically if you generate within Skipper, but if you're generating, pulling a design outside of Skipper, uh, like from jump, uh, you have to set blocking is equal to true. And what that'll do is that'll account for that blocking structure when generating our power. So when you do that, um, so we did that with the target environment. So we see here, um, we generated this uh, power for the split plot design with 200 runs. But note that the uh, the blocking term so here's the blocking term, it's target environment. We still have very low power there, even though we have 200 runs. And that's because effectively, we have far fewer runs on that because that's the blocking factor that only had a certain number of replicates. Um, and so we often will have lower power for those harder to change terms. Uh, but note that we do have high power for the interaction between speed and target environment. And that's the benefit that split plot designs give you, is you get those interaction terms for free. So. You can go through this iter iterative process of generate, evaluate, generate, evaluate, generate, evaluate. A far easier way thing to do is to use this function, calculate power curves. So what we do here is we specify, um, so this function just automates all of that. We are, we're specifying we want to generate uh, designs from 10 to 200 runs um, with that model with an effect size of one. And let's see what that plots. And, and then we do that and we get 
this plot here that tells us what how the power changes for each model term uh, for each uh, over across different trials. So we can see here, yes, no, we cross 80% uh, power at approximately 200 runs. Um, and uh, this just allows you to get a really good uh, idea of sort of the trade space. So you can see here, we also have lots of model terms that um, cross 80% power around 90 runs. So let's say we weren't interested in those other model terms. You could say, okay, you know, we're actually going to remove those terms from the model that take a lot of time because maybe we're not interested in quadratic effects. So you remove those and, and then you recalculate the power curves. And oftentimes you'll see that go down. In fact, here I did that. Um, I went in and removed the quadratic terms. Um, and we see here, uh, instead of 200 runs, now all of the, uh, we get adequate power at about 80% um, at about 120 runs. So just by moving that and recalculating that, now we can say like, okay, well, here's the new traits. Here's the new minimally adequate design. And you don't have to play around and, you know, hit a bunch of buttons to go through uh, and do this manually. Um, so uh, here's where I sort of run through. So you can kind of look on this. Basically, when we actually analyze the data, um, we, uh, you know, we'll have some sort of results that we'll then throw into uh, like the Y variable for a response for the design. And we'll get some sort of p-values out of it. Um, so here, uh, one thing that's important to do when you actually analyze the data is you want to normalize your continuous factors. Now, Skipper provides a helper function to do this. And the reason you want to normalize your factors is so this is for a design with 90 runs. This is the correlation matrix without normalization. So this is the how, mount, uh, how much each uh, term is correlated with other terms, um, which is a lot. We see here it's very high. But when we standardize them to be uh, negative one to one, what happens is this is the new correlation structure. So if you don't normalize your factors, you could actually be seeing correlation that you uh, uh, that is not actually there. So that's that's something important when you're actually analyzing your data that you want to do. Um, so you should always normalize your design. But Skipper does this for you when you're actually analyzing the data. So this is what your design matrix would actually end up looking like um, when you actually run through it. It's uh, if you had some results here, we're generating some fake results. So we have some near scores of like 3.4, 3.7. And these are just random. So this is uh, the null hypothesis. We're basically saying this is just random noise. So if none of the effects had any, our system was perfect, and none of these uh, effects had any sort of effect on our near score, this is just noise. So if we, let's say, tried to fit this, um, so we did this with, the, this is the linear model function, and get the p-values, this is the kind of output that would result. Um, we would get, you know, some list of our terms with our p-values. And here we see that we actually have, considering we're going to 80% confidence, that means any p-values below 0.2 we're calling significant. So we see here we actually do have some significant terms, even though we generated this data with pure noise. Um, there's no effect from any term. And, and that is because we set our alpha to 0.2. Um, and we can actually confirm this um, So uh, uh, by rerunning the simulation over and over and over again. And we'll see when we do that, which is what we do, so this is just some other, we see the same thing with effect power. We see some terms are significant. So when we, um, and, oh, and, and yeah, the other thing, uh, so effect power, there's two different types of effect power. You can, you can fit an ANOVA or do a likelihood ratio test. Statisticians love likelihood ratio tests, um, so they do that often, but there's just two different ways of basically saying, is that model term active? Um, and effect power is really good if you don't actually care about, let's say, individual uh, factor levels. You just want to tell if a term is significant or not. They're usually more powerful than fitting a regression model. However, they are, um, they, they don't give you that information, that same fidelity. Um, so I'm not, so I, I recommend going through this. Basically, I run through a simulation of actually going through and simulating a bunch of random data um, over and over again and, and with, and seeing, like confirming that here, we see that uh, when we run fit random data over and over again, this design, 20% of the time, each one of these terms is significant. And that's because we set our alpha to 0.2. But if, let's say, we actually activate some of these effects. So here, instead of just generating a, uh, a random noise, I actually said, hey, depending on the design, shift the near score a little bit. If it's high altitude, shift it high. If it's low altitude, shift it low. Basically saying we actually do have an effect. The null hypothesis is false. So let's say I run that simulation which we see down here. This is just running, looping through this, simulating results with uh, random results, and then fitting it each time. We actually see that we get some value, some, some number here, 0.706. 
Um, and that actually corresponds exactly to the parametric power calculation. Because what we did here by randomly generating values over and over again and testing to see if they're significant is actually the definition of power. We are doing a Monte Carlo simulation that tests to see if something is significant when it actually is. So these values here, we see um, uh, 0 0.706, 0 0.99, because we activated here altitude speed and the interaction between speed and altitude. We see we have altitude speed and the interaction between speed and altitude, and those corresponding pretty much within uh, an element of noise to the parametric values. And that's because Monte Carlo simulations are really the, the closest truth we can get to calculating what the power is for a particular model. Um, so that's the kind of second interface, the main thing I want to tell you here in our, in our final minutes, um, is this interface is exactly the same thing as the eval design power interface. You feed the exact same inputs, only you also specify, let's say, your effect size in terms of probabilities, or and you have to specify your number of simulations. But here, we, we pass the model, and we get a very equivalent output. So here is the parametric power, and here is the, uh, the Monte Carlo power. You, you see that it's taken to less decimal places, because uh, it, it depends, the number of decimal places, the precision, depends on the number of simulations you do. So if I, let's say, this is 100 simulations, let's say, and we get you know, these power values here, if let's say I increase it to 1,000, we see we get a bit more precision. And there's some uncertainty associated with that. Um, but here, uh, I don't really have time to, to go into this part, but we basically just go through uh, some approximate methods where they fail. Um, just read this on your own, it's, it's some details. but. Um, the important thing is that, uh, and I'm going to skip ahead, so you can specify your binomial effect size. So let's say you're testing a program, you want to test between that 90 and 50% effect size. Here, you just specify, you know, I want to test between 50 and 90%. And now it'll set up that simulation for you. And the other big thing, so this Monte Carlo interface uh, is very robust. You, you can do lots of different types of regression. The one thing you want to check, and this is something that it can, it can help you find, is you want to check your type 1 error inflation. So I mentioned that likelihood ratio test earlier. Um, if let's say you were you were given the tasking of finding like the minimally adequate test design for, you know, absolute minimum. So you, you could have full reign over number of runs, analysis methods, everything. And let's say you found that you, uh, with a plain main effects model, it took you six runs, anything less than that, you couldn't even fit the model. So you did that. And then you discovered when you were playing around the very options in Skipper that if you Turn effect ANOVA, so you used a likelihood ratio test for effect power, you found that uh, you actually had really good power with uh, speed and mode. And you might be like, wow, that, that's great. I, I have adequate power in six runs. Um, however, uh, one thing that you should always check when you're doing these simulations, and Skipper makes it super easy to only detect it, not only detect it, but also account for it, is for type 1 error inflation. So for block designs, for really low numbers of runs. Sometimes you have the issue where you specify your type 1 error rate, but it's not your actual type 1 error rate because you're, you're some approximation that the software is making, not skipper, but like your linear model fails at that low number of runs or when you have blocking. So here uh, we see that when we uh, do the ANOVA, so not the likelihood ratio test, and we do the simulation over and over again, we do get our 20% alpha, so that's good. But if we do a likelihood ratio test, we see our Alpha, which put, should be 0.2, is actually 0.67, which means we are making a false positive rate three times the rate that we would normally consider. Now, Skipper makes it really simple, and um, and here I've plotted this actually over time. You can see that at low sample sizes, this is with no effect size, um, or zero, uh, we see that this is actually uh, a, a very high. So this, is, this, should, this should just be a flat line like we see in the parameter power. So Skipper makes it really easy to do this and account for this. All you have to do is set uh, adjust alpha inflation is equal to true, and it will automatically account for that and adjust for that increased type 1 error rate. Um, so uh, uh, I would say if you have a scenario where you're blocked or very low number of runs, just run this with adjust error inflation is equal to true, and it will account for that you know, corner case, especially if you feel like you're getting away with something. Um, that if you feel like this is something that's too good to be true, that will actually adjust for it. So, um, so let's just put together... Sorry, I'm rushing through this a little bit, the zoom thing threw off my timing. But well, let's say we run through a final analysis. Here we have 30 to 360 runs. We have effect size. We have two different effect sizes. Uh, so 0 0.5 to 0 0.9, 0 0.7 to 0 0.9. And we see here, we put all this information in. It chugs through it, does a Monte Carlo power analysis. So this is binomial response. And we get this beautiful set of curves that analysis to have a really informed discussion on our trade space 
for what model terms we can fit, what resources we have to allocate, what effect sizes we can see. Because we can see that for the 0.5 to 0.7, even with or 0.7 to 0.9 which is the lower one, we will never have enough power within 360 runs. So you can very quickly just look at the plot and say, oh, I can see we need to do a, a bigger effect size or more runs. So that is that. Let me just go to the last two slides. So finally, um, let me go to, oh, and the other thing about uh, Monte Carlo designs is they're really important because as we see here, the, the area where, pale, uh, or where power is most likely to fail is at low number of runs. Um, and that is where approximations, so if you have approximate methods for computing, like uh, logistic regression using like an approximate SNR method, those lower number of runs is where those methods often fail. And that's where power is most important. You know, you, if, when you're right on the edge of something being adequate or not, that's, those scenarios is where you really want to make sure that your methods are computing it correctly, which is what Monte Carlo techniques can do. Um, so finally, uh, so here's a little checklist I'm, I'm giving you. If you, uh, as you go through your DOE process, first determine what your experimental goal is, whether you're interested in prediction, characterization, screening. Um, if you have a complicated design space, make sure, see if it can be more balanced, if you have more points, play around with that, look at the design space, plot that out. Generate power curves, that can be an extremely powerful tool for both the discussion and to let you know what is an adequate design. Always use Monte Carlo methods if you can, because they give you the, the closest link between your analysis methods and your final uh, and your power analysis. So if you want the best analytical basis for your power methods, use those. And once you have your power estimates, always run it first with the effect size is equal to zero, or with uh, or make sure to uh, adjust the for type one error inflation, because that can often lead to inflated error results. And finally, the biggest thing, if I take away one thing from this talk, always make sure that the assumptions that go into your power analysis are matched by your, uh, when you actually do your analysis, because that can have such a dramatic effect on your power and, and, and your, you, the adequacy and uh, of your final results that it's just something uh, I, I think is really important. And, and Skipper makes it really easy to do that by giving you that information uh, during the power analysis portion. So um, here's some links. Uh, if you want to download our, our studio, um, there's a book R for data science, lots of great information about R. Skipper has a GitHub, you can look at the code, download the latest versions from there, it's also on CRAN, workshop materials, and there's a great paper in the Journal of Statistical Software that goes all into detail about what, uh, what you can, um, the, the, the details and the statistics and, and, and everything that goes into it. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you.